So this week we're going to be focusing on mass spectrometry, which is a whole area of biophysics of identifying molecules, identifying species based on their mass to charge ratios. And this is a whole area, um, very hot area of study for proteomics, glycomics, metabolomics, where people are identifying what are the proteins that are present, creating an entire library of the lipids or the small molecule metabolites and the like. So that's what we'll be discussing in detail, the applications of that to these omics fields uh, on Thursday. But before we get into that today, we're going to be getting into all the instrumentation components uh, for mass spectrometry. Um, and before going into this, I guess I started on the wrong slide. Um, I did just want to do a re quick recap because last week we didn't get to talk about the practical use of chromatography. So I did want to talk about this very quickly um, that I have an example FPLC shown here that when we're talking about the mobile phases, you can see they're in bottles on the top being fed into the actual chromatography instrument where the bulk of what's inside this in instrument are the pumps that are controlling the mixing of your mobile phase if you're doing gradient elutions um, and the like and making sure it's like a steady state flow. So that's what is the bulk of what's in here. The workhorse of the chromatography equipment, the column you can see right here, and um, you can switch this column out. And somewhere down here is where you would inject your liquid sample or feed in your sample uh, to the setup. And then when you're eluding, if you're trying to do not just analytical detection, but also collecting it, you can see there's a fractional collector, collector here. So you have a bunch of tubes and it's just gonna, let's say put three milliliters or four milliliters or whatever the like in each of these tubes. And you can then line up which fraction is where your analyte is coming out. So also in here, your detector is also gonna be built into here. Um, so uh, you can do chromatography when I mentioned like column chromatography just by gravity. That's going to be like you just buy a bucket of silica uh, and load that up. And that can be very cheap. You can get pre-purchase kits for a couple hundred bucks or so for gravity separations. And then if you want a fancy instrumentation, tens of thousands, upwards of hundreds of thousands, because they're very modular that you can add different detectors, uh, uh, do multiple columns, all the like. Um, so waters, Agilent are very common vendors for these. Um, and, uh, but you can use columns from any vendor that would then work with uh, these commercial instruments then. Um, if you're doing protein separations like this FPLC, you'll commonly see that placed in a fridge. So keeping everything cool will prevent the proteins from denaturing or aggregating while it's running through the uh, chromatography setup. And in practical use troubleshooting of chromatography, it's very important not to have any air bubbles when you're injecting your sample or adding on a column. You always wanna introduce solvent to those and ensure there's no air bubbles. That's gonna be a whole mess if there are air bubbles. Um, and you can see the, the computer that's hooked up to here is what you use to then design like, okay, what is the flow rate? Uh, what are the different solvents that you're gonna be mixing in for your mobile phase? And um, that, that is what you can use to control uh, the method that you're using to separate. But a lot of this is based on trial and error. If you're trying to separate something new, you'll probably ask someone, okay, what are you using for your biomolecule, I'm going to start with that baseline, see how it goes. If that doesn't work, then, okay, let's change the flow rate and see what happens. Let's change the temperature. Let's see what happens. Let's change the solvent mixture. So it's a lot of time and effort that's used to optimize separations and is why lots of people don't like chromatography um, because it's a lot of waiting. Uh, but uh, if we can move away from that trial and error, that's what some of my research is on. Um, and or the long-term goal that I pitch, uh, that would be a way better way to figure out chromatography. So any questions with that? Um, and also next week when we talk about the instrumentation and the chemistry facilities, like chromatography setups are there. 
Okay. Sorry about that. Shifting back gears, uh, shifting back to mass spectrometry. Um, like I said, goal today is to go over all of the so mass spectrometry. I'm going to abbreviate MS. We're going to be going over the instrumentation. Where the key components are to ionize, um, select, and then detect ions. Um, so with our instrument schematic here, again, this is kind of more designed for uh, spectroscopy, but for spectrometry here with mass, the source would be the fact that you have to inject your sample and then you want to ionize it. So it has to have some sort of negative or positive charge associated with it, typically positive charges. Um, then your ionized sample will pass through here and uh, the key thing is sorting the ions based on their mass to charge ratio. So uh, that's the key component here in a mass spec. And then for the detector, your ions are going to be charged. So these will be ion transducers. So going from an ion to some sort of electrical signal that then you can um, read out with then the analog to digital conversion there. So we'll be going over all the different types of um, ionization methods, selection methods, and sorting methods and detectors that are on mass specs. Um, and next week, next next lecture on Thursday, we'll talk about the applications and we'll have a breakout group on Thursday as well. Um, so the whole thing with mass spec, mass spectrometry, MS, those are all the abbreviations you'll hear is that um, you're separating ions according to their mass to charge ratio. So this mass to charge ratio, we use M for mass and charge as Z. So then doing that as a ratio, you'll see this plotted on the X axis of a typical mass spec measurement. Um, this is also a quantitative measurement. You can see here the Y axis that the height of the peaks has to do with their relative abundance. Um, so mass spec is used to detect um, what elements or molecules are present. Depending how you run this, you can either get atomic information or molecular information. And it also um, determine their concentration. Of what elements are, or what molecules are present. So when we're discussing mass, um, and we've used this unit before, just a reminder that we use Dalton's. And some background on, or just a refresher of what Dalton's are, um, that it's what's used for the unit of masses of atoms and molecules. And do you guys know which atom or which element we use to define the Dalton or what's the gold standard that NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology uses to define what one Dalton is? Do, you, do any of you guys know? You can add it in the chat or unmute yourself. Yep, so Catherine put carbon. So, National Institute of Standards, they'll, they'll use, yep, the C, and Dushani says the C12 isotope. Yep, exactly right. So, um, so the isotope of carbon, exactly, the C12 isotope is exactly, they'll define that as 12 AMUs. So then one Dalton is equal to one twelfth of the neutral, uh, C12 isotope. 
Um, so just as a reminder, that's what we're going to be using for defining mass. Um, and in mass spectrometry, when we're detecting these um, ions of these molecules, it's worth noting that these can be atomic ions. These can be the full molecule in an ionized state, or they can be fragments of molecules. Um, so you can see here some different forms that, okay, we'll go over different sources that if we're using an electron to then ionize, let's say we have this molecule, our molecule is being represented by A, B, C, D. You can have um, this top line would be the molecule itself. You can see that it's the full A, B, C, D. And then that here we have a dot that represents that this is a radical. And then the plus sign represents that it's a positively charged ion. Um, but in the ionization process, you can have fragmentation occur. So that's what's being shown in this line here. That in the ionization process, it splits up uh, your molecule and you can have some atoms and some fragments of that molecule. These fragments can then even react with one another and you can have rearrangements. Or even, uh, so I would say these are intramolecular. So they're happening within the same molecule. So that's the intra and you can even have inter molecular rearrangements, which is being shown down here. So two uh, radical ions of the same molecule or different molecules, you can see the different ordering can rearrange here. So understanding in mass spec what you're detecting, if it's a fragment or rearrangements or the molecule itself, that's part of the process of interpreting these type of spectra. Um, so this spectra here is shown for like a very small organic molecule. I don't have like the exact structure, let's just say something like this. Um, that's pretty simple to interpret. When we get into the applications on Thursday, we'll go over some of the more complicated. You can imagine if you're doing nucleic acids or proteins, they're gonna be much more complicated um, there. So any questions about the concept behind mass spectrometry? Okay. We're going to get into all of the instrumentation there then. So I mentioned on the first slide, the important parts are ionizing, separating, and detecting. So if we're going to draw a block diagram of our mass spec, the first thing is going to be the inlet. So this is to introduce your sample to the mass spec. And let's just draw this box. And you'll see why later I'm drawing it as this dash line. If this is our mass spec instrument here that has these components. So we have an inlet and this is usually introducing microliters or micrograms of your analyt that you're trying to analyze. Um, this can be analyzed or this inlet can be done in uh, the terminology used is you can introduce a batch inlet which would mean that you're introducing your sample as a gas itself which is ideal because mass spec is uh, run under vacuum and your sample is turned into a gas. It can also be a direct probe, which is if you're using a liquid state. And then there's an extra step of turning your sample from a liquid to the gas phase. Um, and many times mass specs are hooked up to a chromatography system, either LC or DC. So you'll 
often seen with HPLC MS or GCMS, um, where the mass spec is used as a detector in a chromatography instrument. Um, so after your sample is introduced to the mass spec, it'll go first to be ionized. And this first step, like I mentioned, is always in the, um, in the gas phase, so the ion source. And for it to be in the gas phase, um, this is done under vacuum. So that's what this dash box means is everything within this box is going to be um, at low pressure. So this is typically 10 to the negative fifths or 10 to the negative eighth tor. And it's done under vacuum because as you're separating these ions, it's important if you have a radical species, you don't want that radical to react with air molecules. Um, so I'll write that up here. So you can, you can imagine that running this under vacuum is something that adds cost adds complications to the instrumentation, and hence why it's rather specialized. Um, so with this first step of the gaseous ion source, um, you bombard your sample with high energy species to form ions. And we'll go over what this what these high energy species are, electrons, photons, you can imagine ions or other molecules. So after your sample is ionized, it'll then move on to our separator, which we then will call the mass analyzer. Which is a significant component. So this will disperse or sort the ions based on that M to Z ratio. Um, and then the last part is gonna be our detector. I guess our second to last part. So converting ions to an electric signal. And then we have outside of the vacuum, this detector of course hooked up to a computer for our signal processing based on the information of what the instrument's doing, but then you get your final readout of your mass to charge ratio versus abundance. So this abundance can be, I guess, typically is reported as a percentage. So you'll get your peaks out that way. So this will then be your final readout to analyze. And on Thursday, we'll go over in more detail what the spectrum mean, but you can see like I kind of group these together that you'll see a large main peak and then some side peaks next to this. And this has to do with that fragmentation that I was mentioning um, that you'll have a majority peak, but you'll have some side processes that lead to this. It's not a full Gaussian spectrum, if you had more buildup, it would be um, or so. Okay, so the rest of the lecture is going to be breaking down uh, each of these different components within the mass spec here, the ion source, the mass analyzer, the detector, um, the inlet, we're not going to go over in much detail, just know that there's these, it can be fed in as gas or a liquid. And just like with chromatography, liquid might be um, a slow uh, needle injection, but then going from that liquid to gas transition, phase transition, you need to do slowly or the like, and similarly with the chromatography as well. Okay. So we're going to start off with the ion source of how do we turn our sample, our analyte, into an ionized gas form. And these are divided up into two types that they can be hard ionization source, which means that you have, you're using a large amount of energy. 
So you have a high efficiency of turning these into ions. Um, but this large amount of energy uh, leaves the molecules in an excited state. Um, and the relaxation from this excited state then fragments the molecule. So this leads to many peaks of M to Z less than the true molecular weight of the molecule that you're analyzing. Um, so this is also destructive as well. So if you're interested in different portions or components of your molecule, a hard ionization source would be useful. Um, but if you're interested in the true molecular weight of your molecule, then um, you use a soft uh, ionization source. So this is the opposite. You'll have little fragmentation. Um, and you're going to have uh, typically uh, a peak located at the true molecular weight. Um, in the ideal case here. So I have two examples over here on the right of some mass spectra. Uh, so if I showed you this guy at the bottom here, would you expect that I used a hard ionization source or a soft ionization source? Yeah, so Rose answered correctly that this would be the hard type spectra. You have many peaks due to all those different fragments, while at the top here you have a single peak uh, due to just some uh, molecule itself. And also you can see this is at a higher molecular weight compared to most of the fragments here. Um, I don't know if these are the same molecules, but it looks like it might be with these two peaks or so. Okay. So those are the two types we're going to go into, I guess, I think I have three or four, let's see, four different ionization sources. So yeah, this is why we have a whole lecture dedicated to the instrumentation. There's a lot of different components um, to how mass specs are set up. Um, so the first one we'll discuss is electron impact ionization. So if you see a mass spec with EI associated with it, that means the source is electron impact. Um, so with this uh, ionization source, you have a combination of a hot filament, um, which will cause the ionization. Um, and then you have a large voltage or potential difference um, or yeah, hot filament with a large voltage between the filament and a nano. So it'll be something like this filament, the anode, and you're gonna have some voltage difference between those two. So this causes electrons to then impact, obviously with this description here, uh, your sample. So if we're representing our sample, some molecule with the letter M, it's going to have an electron come in, react with that, impact that, form your radical ion of your molecule, and two electrons come out here. Um, by having this voltage difference that will then accelerate the ion, with the voltage difference there. And this will give kinetic energy to the ion. So our kinetic energy of the ion is going to be the charge. So the charge state, the Z is gonna represent one typically for this type of ion. Here you can have multiple ionizations if you have plus two or so, but we're gonna stick mostly with what we're discussing here of a single charged ion. So the Z is gonna be equal one. 
times the fundamental unit of charge of an electron um, times your potential difference here. So typically this potential difference is uh, I think 70, 70 volts or so, which this can then be related to the velocity of the electron related to its charge or the ion related to its charge with one half mass times the velocity squared here. Um, so if we take um, if we take the standard value of 70 volts and let's say our molecule we're separating or let's say to get an understanding of the scale of kinetic energies that are used in electron impact ionization, let's calculate the kinetic energy of an electron in a 70 volt potential difference. So we, and let's put this kinetic energy in units of joules per mole. So to do that, I'll plug into this equation. Our charge is just gonna be one. Um, so the Z will just be simply one. We're gonna have our charge of the electron 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs per electron. Our voltage is 70 volts. And then since we want this in units of joules per mole, we're gonna multiply this times Avogadro's number. 6.023 times 10 to the negative, 10 to the positive 23rd um, electrons per mole. So if we do the math here, the number that we would get out is our kinetic energy of accelerating an electron is gonna be 6,700 kilojoules per mole. So pretty high energy here. And if we compare that to the kinetic energy of a covalent bond in molecules, those are typically around 200 to 600 kilojoules per mole. So the comparison of the kinetic energy of our electron in our electron impact ionization technique versus the kinetic energy of a bond, would you expect this ionization source to be hard or soft? So we have 6,700 kilojoules per mole for the kinetic energy of our electrons, 200 to 600 for a covalent bond in our molecule. Would this be a hard or a soft ionization source? No. Oh. So Dishani and Bill say hard, and that's correct. So this is going to be a hard source. As you can guess, this high energy is going to break a lot of bonds there. So because it's a hard source, it's going to have a high amount of fragmentation. So it's typically used for smaller molecules. Uh, so about less than a thousand Dalton or one kilodalton or so. But it's a nice source because it has very high sensitivity due to that fragmentation. So if you're concerned about having this large amount of fragmentation because of the high energy of these uh, electrons. It's pretty, it's pretty much fixed or standard with these electron impact sources that you're gonna be using a 70 volt difference. Um, an alternative to that, if you'd rather have a softer ionization source would be using chemical ionization. So this is a soft alternative. electron ionization. Um, so instead of using electrons themselves for the ionization, you're going to add a reagent gas that's ionized itself. So this reagent gas is typically methane or you can use like ammonia. Um, Etc. like small molecules. And you can see here that this is the methane example um, <clears throat> that you can have a methane ion. It will react with other methane. So you'll have all these different ion species that can be used. And um, so I guess here are the different 
chemicals that can then interact with your molecule. So different methane ions then react with your molecule. So you can see here that our molecule uh, is indicated by M again, and this can be used to um, do a proton transfer. or a hydride transfer with your molecule. So it's an alternative way to um, ionize your molecule. And then since you're kicking off just protons, you're going to have less fragmentation. Um, this is also more versatile because you can select different reagent gases and different voltages, you can then fine tune your ionization um, in the mass spec with a chemical ionization source. Um, but just like electron ionization, it's also limited um, to lower molecular weight uh, species here as well. So if you're interested in looking at small molecules, uh, amino acids like the lipids themselves, uh, Metabolites, that's where you're going to be seeing these electron ionization or chemical ionization sources. If you're interested in large molecules, that's going to be these two, the next two ionization sources that I'll discuss. So these include matrix assisted laser desorption ionization. Or MALDI. So you'll see MALDI very frequently in biophysics applications of mass spectrometry. And what MALDI is, is it's all described right in the acronym here. It's actually a good acronym that describes how it uh, works. So the first thing here is, let's say matrix assisted. So you're going to embed your sample in a matrix. So in the SCOOG book, I've indicated in the notes that table 20-4 has a list of many different types of matrices that are used. These can be sugars, these can be uh, polymers, these can be small molecules or so. So first up, put your sample in a matrix. That's what's shown here where the green is the matrix, the orange is what you're interested in analyzing. Um, so the laser, is then used to kick off your sample. So you're going to have um, the assisted term here means that the matrix is assisting the energy of the laser. So you're going to have a pulse laser. It's typically in the UV, like 254, 350 nanometers, so near UV range. Um, you'll have this pulse laser, and the matrix will absorb that energy. So the energy that's absorbed by the matrix is then transferred to the sample. And your sample will then vaporize from energy and matrix. It will vaporize and it will ionize as well. So okay, I'm going to say one, two, three here. So one, two, three is this desorption and the ionization steps shown right here. And the nice thing with MALDI, so it's gentler than I'd say CI and EI, that you can tune this with the laser. Um, and it also, since you're using a coherent light source that's focused to a spot, it allows spatial information as well. And so because it's gentler, uh, you can also work with higher molecular weights. Um, this is the highest molecular weight uh, ionization source that you can use. So 
you can get up to, I guess, 500 kilodaltons or so. So this can even be used to look at supramolecular uh, complex, complexes. Um, and because of that, it also has this high sensitivity as well. So focusing on the spatial aspect, I did want to emphasize that or give an example here. Uh, this is um, a histology section in panel B here of part of a mouse kidney. And they did MALDI where you're able to then scan your laser and collect a spectrum at every single point as you scan over uh, this kidney slice. And they were looking at different glycoproteins um, where each of these squares or circles or colors represents a different sugar unit. Uh, and this panel C here corresponds to uh, the intensity, this relative, I guess I'm missing, relative intensity of these peaks. The color scale here corresponds to the peak height spatially within the kidney slice for this guy. And then this figure here is panel D, and then this is the overlay of C and D, where the green is representing this glycoprotein, the purple is representing this guy over here, and you can see that there's a variation in the distribution here, that you can see this green guy is more along the edge of the kidney, the purple is more internal, showing that there's spatial variations in these glycoproteins within the same cell and tissue type within the kidney itself. Um, so just an example of some MALDI imaging. And in the problem set, I've asked you to look a little bit at um, uh, some imaging, recent imaging applications of MALDI imaging as well. And I wish I could read the scale bar. I'm guessing this is around a millimeter or so uh, for the scale bar. Um, but interesting to see this can even get down to much smaller resolution. You can imagine since you're using UV light and the pulsed laser, you can get high spatial resolutions as well. So it's a cool application there. And then the last ionization source that I want to discuss is electron spray ionization. This is abbreviated ESI. And here, this is if you're dealing, it's commonly used with like larger analytes as well. Um, it can work with up to 200 kilodalton sources um, and also uh, is commonly used with uh, liquid injection or inlets. So the concept here is, you can see spray, um, is that you have a liquid pass through a needle And this will then form droplets. Um, there's also, those droplets will have different charges and you have an electrode present as well. So you can see in this schematic here, we have our capillary needle. As these droplets are forming, um, they're gonna have charges based on their size and they're gonna be accelerated towards an electrode that you have there. Um, and you can see it's a rel it's a it's a pretty high voltage difference. Um, uh, that will accelerate those drop it droplets. Um, <clears throat> so those droplets move through the field. Based on their size. Smaller ones will move faster, uh, larger ones will move slower. And as they're moving through this field, they're also moving through um, different vacuum stages. And this will cause solvent to evaporate off. Leading to smaller and smaller droplets until you reach just the analyte itself. 
um, um, this potential also causes the ionization and balancing or fine tuning the voltage and the vacuum. Uh, you can then tune the fragmentation. And so, uh, so you can see even these uh, plates here and the vacuum stages, they can basically be used in the same way optically that you can focus light down and tune uh, the selectivity of wavelengths of light or the spatial information of light. You can do the same thing here with apply potentials and vacuum stages to tune what masses you're selecting uh, through here. Um, the fact that you can oh, Aaron, you're done. the fact that you can use a liquid injection. This is commonly hooked up to when you're doing like HPLC or LCMS. This is where you most commonly see it here. So ESI and MALDI, because of their compatibility with these high molecular weight molecular weights, you'll see commonly being used um, in biophysics more than you'll see it in chemistry applications as well. Okay, so those are all the four sources that I wanted to go over. Are there any questions? Okay. Now we're moving on to our mass analyzer. If we want to disperse and sort these ions that we've created with our ionization sources. Um, an important thing to note with mass analyzers is that uh, they're defined by their resolution, which for mass spectrometry is what is your average mass between two peaks versus the distance between those two peaks. Um, so this is very similar to how we can define resolution in spectroscopy. For spectroscopy, it might be your wavelength over the distance between two peaks, or it's the inverse of what we define for chromatography on last Thursday where you can see this width would be similar to like the average here and the distance between those uh, peaks. So common theme in assessing the analytical capabilities of instruments and defining what the resolution is just based on the different peaks that you have. Um, and if they're broad or single peaks, we'll define like what you're using there. Um, so the first mass analyzer that I wanna discuss is called a magnetic Selector, magnetic sector. Okay. And this is simply ions passing through an electromagnet. And this electromagnetic, electromagnet is curved. So you're balancing um, magnetic and centripetal forces. Um, and by controlling this electromagnet, uh, you can scan a magnetic field to then select your ions. So this curved aspect is typically 60 degrees, 90 degrees, um, and sometimes maybe even 180 degrees or so. Um, so in balancing, we're going to call our forces of the magnetic and the centripetal forces must be balanced. Um, so our magnetic force is going to be our magnetic field times our uh, quanta of charge Z the fundamental unit of charge and then the velocity of your ion that's moving. And that's going to be balanced with the centripetal forces of this being curved, um, where that's going to be uh, your mass, your velocity over the radius of the curvature here. So with this 
uh, equality here. Um, we can then rearrange this to see how this relates to the velocity. And that will say our velocity will depend on our magnetic field, the charge. Wait a second. Yeah, the extra term in my notes that we should remove over the mass. So this is a key equation that you get out from a magnetic sector. You can then relate this to the equation that we had before for kinetic energy. And by putting these equations together, you get that your mass to charge ratio selection will be based on the square of the magnetic field, the radius squared times the electron charge over two times the voltage. So you can see here, these are the variables that you can use in a magnetic sector to then select your different mass to charge ratios. You can vary your magnetic field. The radius is gonna be pretty fixed for your instrument. You're not gonna be able to like easily switch out different electromagnets with different curvature, but also the applied voltage that you use um, in the selection uh, can drive uh, your selection of your different masses. Um, so you can use B, V, and it's a little hard to do R here. Um, this equation also shows you that um, your selection capabilities on the high end of the mass is only limited by how strong your magnetic field can be. So the stronger your magnetic field, the higher masses you can analyze. Um, and then the lower M to Z resolution is based on, uh, on the translational kinetic energy of the, of the ions. Uh, at room temperature or the KVT. So uh, this aspect here of the fact that running this instrument, running this analyzer at room temperature uh, leads to your resolution capabilities being about approximately less than 2000. So this magnetic sector analyzer um, isn't the highest resolution analyzer there but you can overcome or improve upon this low resolution selection um, by adding an additional uh, component. So this would be the second type of analyzer I wanna discuss is double focusing mass spectrometry. And this uses a, I can't underline this. So you use a combination of the magnetic sector and um, so that's taking advantage of a magnetic field and then you add in an additional electric field selection. Based on, so hence the term double here since you're using both an electric field and a magnetic field here. So this electric field sec selection is typically called using electrostatic analyzer. Or ESA. So you can see that here in this schematic where this is the ESA, where you have two metal plates that you apply a voltage across um, to then a DC voltage. So then you have a constant um, electric field. And then this is a magnetic sector here where you're gonna be using your magnetic field to then select out your ion. So there's different forms of double focusing mass spectrometry analyzers. So here, this is showing first the ion source, first using your electric field, then your magnetic field. They can also be swapped um, 
And down here, this A and B would then be your detector. Uh, but there's also setups where you have those swapped, where you do the magnetic sector first and electrostatic sector second. Um, so these are also called double, so this is double focus, but also the magnetic sector alone sometimes is referred to as a single focus um, uh, if it's used alone. So that's an alternative term. So single focus, double focus, I'd say that's one classification of a mass analyzer. Um, another type is time of flight or TOF. These are commonly combined with MALDI. And these can be quite large because the main thing that you're taking advantage of here is that um, ions travel faster or slower over distances um, <clears throat> based on their mass to charge ratio. So this will be, you typically have like a, it's called a free drift tube. These can be like one meter long. They can be multiple meters if you want higher resolutions. Um, uh, so going back to our kinetic energy equation here. The key thing is this velocity term here. So um, I'm not going to go through the whole uh, derivation, but the time it takes to travel through this free drift tube and also other types of analyzers uh, or detectors. Um, this will show up on the problem set. Um, this time over a certain distance, the time it takes an ion to travel over a certain distance dx um, is related to its mass over 2e, the voltage that you use for, um, for the acceleration times that dx. So time, time. So this is what time of flight is taking advantage of. So in this schematic here, you can see they have the MALDI pass through the electric field generator, which would then be your voltage here. And then this time of flight will depend, smaller things will reach the detector first. They're gonna have higher velocities um, compared to larger constituents here. Um, so some aspects of time of flight equipment is that um, since it's paired with MALDI, you're using a pulse laser. So you have a pulse production of ions. So this is gonna be, need some fast electronics. Uh, to line up with the uh, pulse production. Um, the nice thing with time of flight, like I mentioned, longer your tube, the best, better your resolution that can reach very high resolutions of being able to discriminate discriminate between ions that are different by one atomic mass unit. So very high resolutions and it can pretty much work with an unlimited mass range based on how much space you have to put a very long uh, free drift to there. Um, so because of that, you can work with very high masses as well. So this is why you'll see MALDI time of flight used with protein supermolecular complexes. And the like. Okay. Two more mass analyzers to discuss. Um, the fourth one I want to mention is quadrupole. Yeah. 
pass it around here. Quad, meaning four, you can see here in the schematic that you have four metal rods. And using DC and AC voltages, you create a high mass or low mass filter. voltages here. So you can see um, with the AC and DC voltages, um, based on what you're applying, um, you can then select this. So if we want to, I'll give an example of a high mass filter first. So if you apply a positive DC voltage, that's going to repel uh, at a high value say high positive DC voltage. That's going to repel um, heavy ions. And those heavy ions, let's say they're this red line here, will stay in the center of the quadrupoles. So that's going to be across one set, one pair of these rods. The other pair of rods, let's say we're going to have um, a low AC voltage. So the lighter ions are going to oscillate with that field. And they're going to hit the quadrupoles, hit the rods, and um, be neutralized. So you could do something similar where if you switch what's high and what's low, you can then tune and filter out the high masses or the low masses um, here. So you can scan voltages to select all, all M to Z ratios there. Um, because there's no magnetic field, these are typically cheaper. Um, they're also very compact as opposed to the time of flight, which can take up a room or so. Um, but this is limited to lower molecular weights, about less than four kilodalton or so. Okay. And then finally, I wanna mention that there's tandem mass spec analyzers. Um, that's where you use two or more uh, This is where you start to get into um, the crazy acronyms of LC, MS, MS. So LC with tandem mass spectrometry, we're going to use one. Let's say this one's going to be like a soft method. This one's going to be a hard method um, with different analyzers um, or multiple, multiple quadruples. So you can even see with tandem mass MS, you can even use like three or more quadruples. Which again, this will increase your selectivity where one phase of the mass spec will detect certain ions, the next one will detect something else. So in the same way that we talked about like 2D IR spectroscopy, we talked about 2D or multidimensional LC methods. I would say it's common that you'll see people specializing in mass spec um, uh, using combinations of these. And I'll note, maybe I'll talk about this more on Thursday, that the American Society of Mass Spectrometry, um, that's a large uh, scientific organization. They have their own conferences every year that people that do mass spec research, it's a big field. Um, they have the Journal of Mass Spectrometry. This conference is annual, uh, uh, quite well attended, that this is where you'll see the things where people are doing LCMS, MS, or MALDI time of flight, quadrupole MS, where they are really building their own mass spec spectro spectrometers um, to have these specialized applications. Okay. Any questions with the mass analyzers? Okay. 
Last slide then, we're gonna to get to the detectors, which there's a lot of concepts here that are familiar from our discussions on microscopy and spectroscopy um, because um, once you convert these guys into electrons, it's just like how um, many of those other detectors work with. We all want electrons at the end of the day uh, to have our readouts, no matter what the instrumentation is. Um, so something that would be similar to the EM CCDs that we've talked about with imaging would be an electron multiplying diode. Um, this is going to be what I've shown here where the simple one is going to be a 1D detector where you're going to have an ion hit a metal, which will then transfer that energy to form an electron. So that electron is then going to cascade to additional dynodes. So one electron becomes like two electrons or multiple and keep going and going and going where you can have a very high gain of 10 to the fifth or 10 to the eighth. So this has high sensitivity due to that high gain um, but it's going to be low accuracy for abundance. So because it's nonlinear, you can't say one electron does not equal one ion. Or X number of electrons, there's no correlation there between not a direct correlation between a number of electrons and ions because uh, it's not going to be linear with every cross. So high sensitivity and it's also very fast. So those are the benefits there. Another type of detector used is called a Faraday cup. You can see here um, you have your ions come in and enter a Faraday cage. Um, and this Faraday cage is hooked up to a resistor. And when they hit that Faraday cage, it's gonna decrease um, the voltage across the resistor. So you can see that this guy is connected to ground. So as you detect this change in the voltage across the resistor, that will then correlate to the ions that are being uh, detected. So this is linear. So it's more accurate for abundance. So you can say your electrons um, can correlate an electron or a voltage drop you can see can be quantitatively related to the ions that you see. Um, the problem is that it's much slower and lower sensitivity. So if you're concerned is the abundance, go with a Faraday cup. Your concern is I want a fast response um, or I have a low amount of analysts, go with the electron multiplying dynode. Um, so these, I've described them here, these schematics, these are from the SCOOG book. Those are for 1D that then of course arrays have been constructed. So then you can increase um, the amount of data that you're collecting. So this is more commonly used. And what? Okay. So that's why I had to cover today. I pointed Skooks in me if you need an external reference. Chapter 20 is about molecular mass spectroscopy. Some of the detectors are mentioned in chapter 11 that's focusing more on atomic, which is more related to chemistry um, that we aren't going over for small, for atomic detection. Chapter 20 is going to be the workhorse. Um, I should have updated this. I found, I was digging through leak. I didn't find mass spec, but there is one section that's a page and a half long, which I think is kind of crazy for a biophysics book because that's a huge area of research. Um, so we'll get into the applications nice here um, and should be more exciting than just the instrumentation alone. So uh, with that, are there any questions or I guess I'll see you guys on Thursday if there's none.
you guys on.